Lord Jesus, we, we just always are full of praise to you. Every day of every week, all the time, during all the moments of the day, during the good times and bad times, our hearts are elevated with praise to you because of who you are. And Lord, one way that we show our worship of you is by attentiveness to the word of God. You have given us this holy word. You have preserved it over the generations. You've made it so available to us who live in this in this country so that we can freely read it anytime we want. We can have it on our phones, our, our, our tablets. We can have print copies. We can have little copies that are small enough to stick in a, a purse or a pocket. We can have large print copies for those of us who have trouble seeing now. But you've made it so widely available. And we can worship you by giving our attentiveness to it and naturally by giving you our full obedience and having you as Lord of our lives. Please bless the preaching of the word in this place today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And once again, if you're watching by the live stream, a warm welcome to you as well. I don't like to leave you out. For today's message, I actually borrowed a few thoughts from another pastor. His name is Pastor Melvin Newland. Um, he is or was a pastor in Oklahoma. And I made a lot of adapt- adaptations to it, but nevertheless, if I use somebody else's material, I like to tell you that so you don't find out later and say, you're plagiarizing. Do you plagiarize all your sermons? And just like to be very open whenever I do that. The events of the original Palm Sunday are recorded, as we said earlier, in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But this, um, earlier I read the math, Matthew's version. Right now I want to read the Lucan version, the version, of course, recorded by, by Luke, starting at verse 28 of chapter 19 of Luke's Gospel. Here we go. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the road, or the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. I wish that somehow all of us could go to Jerusalem and relive the events of the first Palm Sunday. And how exciting it would be to be part of that original event, be one of the, the huge crowd that was there, and walk down that winding road from the Mount of Olives, past the Garden of Gethsemane, across the Kidron Valley, and up through the great eastern gate into the city of Jerusalem. It would be a parade that we would never forget. As a nation, we love parades. Maybe most nations of the world love parades, I'm not sure. On Thanksgiving and New Year's, we turn on our TVs to watch the big parades. Back in 1984, Beth and I were 
privileged to be living in Pasadena, California, and to be present and watch the Rose Parade live. And it really was an unforgettable memory, just one of those you know, things I've done in my life and nobody knows about, and yet it was a special day. Special to actually say I was there and I watched the Rose Parade live. Chicago has all kinds of parades, and some of them, of course, are not so good. And I wouldn't recommend you be there or take your kids to them. But typically, we line our streets with fire engines, we line our streets hearing the fire engines, watching the drum and bugle corps, smiling at Shriners and bathtub cars or on lawn tractors, and watch the ever-present politicians shaking hands and handing out buttons and candy and flyers. And for that one day, we smile and shake hands with a politician we would never dream of voting for. And if we're a child, we're waiting for the, you know, the right float that's throwing candy out so we can quick run out from the sidelines and scoop up a lot of candy and then run back to mom and dad. As Americans, we honor our Super Bowl, our World Series teams with parades in our home cities. And now we find ourselves hoping that they just won't grow violent next time around. There's an old story told, I don't know if it's true or not, it's a good story, but an elderly missionary who returned to the United States to retire. He and his wife had spent over 40 years serving in Africa, but now he was alone. His wife and two children had long since found their final resting place in the soil of Africa. As he got off the plane, he saw a great crowd of people waiting at the gate, Some were holding signs, others were waving banners, and he could even hear the sounds of music above the shouting voices. And for a few seconds, he thought, have they actually come out today to welcome me home? But no, that wasn't the case. On his plane was a politician returning from their visit to Africa. And during his visit, the politician had been catered to at every level, waited on by everybody having all of his needs met, and now he's being welcomed back to the United States with all the ceremony that his nation could provide. And as he, the missionary, waited at the airport, the contrast was almost too much for him to bear. And for a moment, he began to feel sorry for himself, and he started to pray, Father in heaven, why? I have served you faithfully and for so long, and yet look, I don't expect much, but is it wrong to desire that there be some kind of a welcome home? And then almost as if God had spoken out loud, the old missionary heard him say, but my son, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. And it's true. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. And as children of God, someday we want to hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. But every once in a while, wouldn't it be nice if our peers, if our colleagues, if our brothers and sisters in the Lord would just pat us on the back, if we could just hear some applause from the crowd. Everyone from the kid on the t-ball team to the employee of the month to the brand new waitress at Cheddar's restaurant appreciates applause. They appreciate praise. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem provided an opportunity for the people to applaud Jesus. They had heard of him. Everybody had heard of him. They had seen, some of them had actually seen his amazing miracles. They had seen instantaneous healings. They had seen water turn into wine. They had seen um, bread and fish multiplied to feed huge crowds. They knew of his love for children. They knew that he affirmed women. They knew that he wasn't shy to go up against the religious leaders who would put burdens upon their shoulders when they themselves wouldn't even lift a finger to help. Palm Sunday was their day 
to applaud Jesus. It was a day of joyful worship. And this morning we're going to look at the various characters in that Palm Sunday story. There were, of course, the people in the crowd. It was Passover time, and people from all over the world were crowding into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. News got out somehow that Jesus was on his way. The much lauded prophet and miracle worker just passing by the towns of Bethpage and Bethany. And so crowds of people stop what they're doing, and they rushed out to see Jesus and to join in a parade. It was exciting enough to be in Jerusalem for the Passover, but wait, there is a parade outside. We've heard that Jesus is here. Now, there were actually two crowds that day. One crowd was accompanying Jesus as he came from Bethany. The other crowd was surging out from Jerusalem because they heard that he was outside the gates on his way. And the crowds must have just flowed together in one great big surging mass. Jesus was coming, and the crowds met him the way they would receive a conquering hero. The sight of this tumultuous welcome sent the Jewish authorities into depths of despair. It seemed like nothing they did would stop the people from following Jesus. And it was starting to get out of control from their perspective. Besides his admirers, who else would have been in the crowd that day? There would have been the ones who had heard of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead who were hoping that maybe on that day he'd do something else stupendous and they'd be able to witness it with their own eyes. And no doubt there were some in the crowd who were holding back, squinting their eyes, wondering how much longer they would have to tolerate this intrusion, this one. Because for many, this is true today as well, the status quo is much more comfortable than new wineskins. I think for most of us, I know for myself, I'd rather have the status quo. The known, the predictable is more comfortable than when everything gets mixed up and changed. There were the 12 disciples, and there were throngs of followers who were hoping that this king, the son of David, was going to bring the kingdom now and make the kingdom of God happen in the here and now, deliver them from earthly problems and woes and, and oppression by Rome. They were hoping this was going to be the moment when Rome would be overthrown and there'd be a time of peace and prosperity for the Jews. And they were just hoping that this is the day, this is the start of it. Finally, it's going to happen. There would also have been, of course, in the crowd, the curious sightseers, they were in town for the Passover and looking for some kind of fun and excitement. I wonder if you've ever been someplace on vacation and suddenly found out there was something else going on there that you didn't know about, and you and your family quick become part of that extra, um, extra excitement of something that you didn't even know was going to, going to happen. There would have been no doubt a lot of people present on the original Palm Sunday who simply were just caught up in a parade mentality. There's fun and excitement, so we don't know what it's all about, but let's just go out and be part of it and have fun. Who knows? Maybe somebody will throw some candy, too. Everybody loves a parade, even if we don't know what it's honoring or what it's about. In 2006, Beth and I were celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary, and it had been in my heart for years I say my heart, because I'm not sure to this day, but it's really best ideal of celebrating our 25th. But I wanted to repeat our original honeymoon. Our original honeymoon, we had started out in Santa Rosa, California, um, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. We got married in Santa Rosa, and we left soon after the wedding and just headed down south, headed down the coast of California, every night staying in a different town, a different hotel, and so it was my dream that on our 25th wedding anniversary, we would repeat the exact trip that we had taken on our honeymoon, 
going to the same towns, and yes, staying in the same exact hotels if they still existed. Because I had little notes, I had a little book, I saw a little book at home of itemizing every day of our honeymoon, where we stayed, how many miles we drove, and how much money we spent every day. Even I have recorded that I spent like 65 cents for ice cream for Beth one day. And that is recorded for posterity. Someday I'll bring my little honeymoon book in and show it to you. You know, people, they get horrified when I say I kept a diary during my honeymoon. Well, if you know anything about George P. Jones, you know what he has written down there. How many miles I drove, how much money I spent, and what hotel we stayed at, and naturally the cost of the hotel. Anyway, 2006, we repeated our honeymoon trip. We found ourselves at Pebble Beach in Monterey, California. And we were having lunch there at Pebble Beach. Felt pretty nice to be at Pebble Beach having lunch. And the lunch menu wasn't too expensive. But there was a, a lot of obvious commotion. You just sensed there was something going on. There were um, CHP, California Highway Patrol, motorcycles outside. There were those big black suburban-type vehicles, the kind you associate with Secret Service or FBI or or something like that. And there were just people, like, crossing the street back and forth. And and we tried to find out what is going on. And we, we asked around a little bit, and the first answer we got was that the um, Prime Minister of Israel was present at Pebble Beach, and that's why all the security and excitement. Went, okay, Prime Minister of Israel is here. But then we found out what was really going on. Our waiter said, Bill Clinton is here, and he's playing golf, and he's at the 18th hole right now. If you want, you can run down and meet him. Well, I ran down and met him. Now, Bill Clinton wasn't somebody that I had voted for. I didn't especially like him as a politician or as a president, but Bill Clinton is on the golf course, and I can go down and shake his hand. And, and so I ran down there, and Beth, by the way, did not. She stayed up on top of the hill. I ran down. And he was a very, very um, charismatic individual. I mean, his personality, he just has a huge person. It's like Barack Obama, you know, huge personality. You'd like to spend the afternoon with him. And he was waxing eloquent about his favorite saxophone, and talking about his daughter, Chelsea, and and he let us take pictures, and he shook everybody's hand, including my hand. And it was just a real real special time, and I'm still excited to tell you that I met Bill Clinton and and shook his hand. There's something about um, groups of people that does that to us, and we don't want to miss out. We want to be included and be part of the fun. Well, the most important person, of course, on that first Palm Sunday was... Jesus. In such a situation, it was obviously impossible for Jesus to to speak to the crowd. I mean, an excited crowd, a crowd that's in the frenzy of all their their emotion, they don't stop to listen. You can't even make your voice be heard. And so Jesus did something that all could see. He sent for a donkey, a donkey's colt, and he comes riding into Jerusalem on it, a dramatic fulfillment of a prophecy given in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. I hope you know that that there are just hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament written a long time, hundreds of years before the time of Christ, that were fulfilled very precisely, very exactly during the earthly ministry of Jesus. It almost gives you goosebumps when you look at some of these things. And, and if you're a doubter, you say, oh, well, maybe that was written after it happened. But if you any, have any kind of an intellect, it's obvious to all when these Old Testament books were written, and they were written long before Jesus came on the scene. And you find, for example, what we're talking about in the book of Zechariah, this prophecy, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that was written 500 years before Jesus walked into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey for the first Palm Sunday. That's just one of many prophecies fulfilled in the life of Christ. And that passage tells us some things about Jesus and why it was important to have this particular parade. 
says, See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. This parade was clearly announcing to the world, plainly, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one, that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he is clearly coming to bring salvation. But it was also saying that Jesus was, is a very special kind of Messiah. We normally think of a donkey as a lowly animal, and yet in the East, a donkey was considered very noble. Kings, princes, and judges rode on donkeys. A king would often ride upon a horse when he was bent on war, but he would typically ride a donkey when he was coming in peace which, of course, is significant for the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Zechariah said the king would be gentle and riding upon a donkey, and Jesus deliberately fulfilled that prophecy to call attention to the fact that he came not as a war maker, but as one who would bring peace. Specifically, he comes, he was coming, so that we might be at peace with God by having our sins forgiven. He is good news for that one that is broken and contrite. He is good news for the one that just knows that they're they're so messed up, so full of sin, sin, they can't fix themselves. He is such good news when he comes and says, I am coming as the Prince of Peace, the one that can make peace between you whose sins are as scarlet And with my Father, God the Mighty Father. The donkey's owners also fit into these events. Did you catch that Luke did not refer to the donkey's owner, but to the donkey's owners? Multiple. And evidently this donkey was owned by more than one person, um, probably because they weren't cheap. They were expensive to own and to maintain. Probably one person couldn't afford a good donkey usually, so they'd pull their funds, and just like you might pull your funds and buy a limousine and put it in service, they bought a donkey and with their pooled resources and put it out there for, for rental. Have you ever wondered, I mean, if you have an analytical mind like I do, which isn't always a blessing, have you ever wondered how Jesus knew the donkey was there? Was he using his supernatural power as God? to know exactly that there was a donkey there and where to tell his disciples to find it? Did the Holy Spirit move upon those owners so that when the disciples said, the Lord has need of it, that they say, fine, no problem, help yourself, we'll help you untie it? Maybe, I don't know. Or maybe Jesus had walked up and down that street many times, knew that they kept a donkey there. He might have already talked to the owners and said, you know, I don't need it today. But there's going to be a day soon when I'm going to need that donkey. Could I borrow it? I'll send a couple of my guys over, and when they show up, please let them have it. We don't really know whether he was exercising his supernatural knowing all things or whether he had just set it up in a way you and I might might set it up. But whatever the case, the day finally comes, and Jesus tells his disciples, go into town and you'll find a colt, a donkey, No one has ever ridden on it, and when you find it, untie it. And if anyone asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it, and that will be enough. And that's exactly what happens. They find the colt, and they untie it, and sure enough, the owners confront them and say, what are you doing? Why are you untying untying the, the colt? And they reply, the Lord needs it. Donkeys were prized possessions. They were means of transportation. They were beasts of burdens and could be used on the farm to pull a plow. They did many things that were strenuous that men could not do by themselves. And so this donkey was a rather valuable possession. And yet Jesus said, tell them the Lord needs it. And when they heard it, they gave it up. And when they were given that donkey up, they were giving the very best they had, and they were giving something very valuable, and they were giving perhaps even the most they had to give. Which leads us to a question I just have to ask all of us. 
What is the most important thing in your life right now? Don't say it out loud, but what is the most important thing in your life right now? Is it your friends? Is it a relationship? Is it your children? Is it your career? Is it your money? Is it a car? Is there something else that is just really valuable to you that that means the most to you? And I would say that however we answer that question, however you answer the question that is asked you, reveals a whole lot about you. It probably reveals what is centermost in your life, what is centermost on the, the throne of your life, if you will. And if Jesus came by today, if he came by your home and called attention to that thing that means the most and says, I need that, I need to use that, would we be willing to give it up? Or would we say, well, you know, take something else instead. Well, don't touch that. You can have this. Or, well, why do you need that? You own everything anyway. Would we be willing to give him the thing that we hold most dear in our lives? Or would we just hold on to it and hold it close to our hearts? The owner said, whatever the Lord needs, if we have it, it's his. And they gave up the donkey. And, of course, we can't forget the last character in the Palm Sunday narrative, the donkey himself or herself. Donkeys play a relatively important part in the Scriptures. You find them throughout the Bible. Abraham used a donkey when he headed off to sacrifice his son Isaac. Of course, if you know the story, you know, he didn't end up needing to sacrifice his son, but he thought he was going to. And he takes, takes a donkey with him to head up to where he was going to slay his son and, and offer sacrifice to God. It was a donkey that taught Balaam a valuable lesson. And if you don't know that story, you've got to go home and read it. It's such a fun story, fascinating story. Balaam's a fascinating man, by the way, in the Bible. Um, many years ago, we had somebody that was a um, very inexperienced preacher. And I asked him on an occasion to preach in our church. Um, I won't tell you who it is, but um, probably the first time they'd ever preached in their life. And they saw fit before they preached to show me their notes ahead of time. And it wasn't that I had required that of this person, but boy, when they showed me their notes, was I ever glad (laughs) that they did because they developed a sermon on Balaam. And their conclusion was that Balaam was a wonderful example in the Bible, somebody to be followed. And nothing could be further from the truth. I said, you can't say that, because Balaam, a very shameful fellow, and even down to the second chapter of Revelation, it mentions Balaam, and how he deceived his own people and led them into sin, even sexual immorality. Yes. So, so Balaam was not a good guy. He learned that this morning. But it was a donkey in the early um, books of the Bible um, that taught Balaam a valuable lesson and even spoke. A donkey spoke. You say, well, how can a donkey speak? Well, I'll answer that question when I tell you how God can create the world with create light with just the word of his mouth, how God can be eternal, everlasting, uh, how God can raise the dead, how God can heal the sick. When I get the answers to all those questions, I'll tell you how a donkey can speak, too. But if God wants a donkey to speak, a donkey will speak. Is that difficult for God? Of course that's not difficult. You also find a donkey mentioned in the story of Samson, another great story of the Bible. Um, Samson slew, that means killed, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And in case you think, as Christmas cards like to portray, that leading up to the birth of Christ in the, in the manger in Bethlehem, that Mary 
went into Bethlehem on the back of a donkey, um, very full of child, while her husband Joseph held the reins and walked beside her. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Now, I might surprise you, but it's on all the Christmas cards. We do it in the Christmas plays, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that Mary, full of child, was on the back of a donkey. And some of you look at me like, I don't think that's true. I think that's in the Bible, Pastor George, where you can go home and look it up, but you will not find it. And now in the last part of Jesus' life, we see a donkey carrying Jesus in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Horses are, of course, beautiful animals with coats that shine in the sun. They have flowing manes that ripple in the breeze and long, graceful legs that can just gallop the miles effortlessly. They have soft eyes and they make a sound that radiates power and strength. And why does my mind go to Mr. Ed at a time like this? I don't know. If you're old enough to remember Mr. Ed, I used to love the way he'd answer the telephone. That was the best part, I think. People love horses, don't they? We probably have a lot of horse lovers in this room. I mean, how many little kids want to have their own horse? It's just a thing. When was the last time you saw a donkey in a beer commercial? <laughs> Folks will travel to see the Lipizzans. We admire the Royal Canadian Mountain Police between their beautiful uniforms and their steeds upon which they ride. I mean, who doesn't appreciate that? But then there's the poor donkey. His hair looks like ours does when we first get up in the morning. The tail is unkempt. His mane is nothing beautiful to behold. The ears are too big, they're floppy. And his brain causes all of us to laugh. <laughs> and yet, on the road to Jerusalem, this little donkey hears the people shouting, Hosanna, and sees them spreading their cloaks on the road in front of him. And for a while, this donkey that is not supposed to be in parades is in a parade, and he's the focal point of attention. Why? Because he is carrying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Someone has written a fanciful sequel to this event entitled Only a Donkey, and I think you'll enjoy this. The donkey awakened, his mind still savoring the afterglow of the most exciting day of his life. Never before had he felt such a rush of pleasure and pride. He walked into town and found a group of people by the well. I'll show myself to them, he thought, but they didn't notice him. They went on drawing water and paid him no mind. Throw your garments down, he said crossly. Don't you know who I am? And they just stared at the donkey with amazement. Someone slapped him on the side and told him to move on. Miserable heathens, he muttered to himself. I'll just go to the market where the good people are. They'll remember me. But the same thing happened. No one paid him any attention as he strutted down the main street in front of the marketplace. The palm branches, where are the palm branches, he shouted. Yesterday you waved palm branches. Hurt and confused, the donkey returned home to his mother. Foolish child, she said gently, don't you realize that without him, you're just an ordinary donkey? If we ever have a parade in our life, it'll only be because Jesus is sitting upon the throne of our life. The only real purpose in life, the only real significance is when we make ourselves available to serve him, to be used for his purposes. And just like the donkey, we are not very significant in ourselves. But then Jesus comes, and he makes all the difference because he makes us his own. Palm Sunday has a message for us today. Jesus is passing by, and he is saying, 
The Lord needs you. The Lord needs you. How will we respond? Will we turn our backs the way the Pharisees did? Will we support him for just a while like most of the people did? And then get back into the real world and crucify him over again? Will we be like the owners of the donkey who gave what they had just so there could be a parade? Will we be like the donkey and allow Jesus to use us any way he sees fit for as long as he wants, any way whatsoever, being willing to sacrifice everything without expecting anything in return? If you, either somebody sitting here today or somebody watching at home, is outside of the kingdom of Jesus Christ today, I extend to you the invitation to become one of his followers. To be changed and transformed by his mercy and by his grace. And to be obedient to him by confessing his name in faith. Will you invite him into your heart and into your life? Will you allow him to be the king of your life? It's really the only way he's willing to come. He doesn't come as just a willing participant in whatever we want to do, whatever we want our life to look like. He says, I'll come into your life and I'll fill it, but only if I'm in charge. Only if I am king. You know, sometimes we, 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 don't, we don't do the gospel justice by not explaining it to people properly enough. Sometimes we, we make it sound like all you have to do is, is say a little prayer Say, yeah, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. Amen. And now I'm going to heaven. Without including the fact that he says, you must take up your cross and follow me. I must be Lord. If I'm not Lord, I can't be Savior. I have to be both. I was so heartened. Um, About a week or two ago, I was listening to Moody Radio one day, and they had a a program on... um, in, in the course of the program, someone called in. And the person that called in was a man, obviously a male, a man, and he was just, just crying, just broken. And, you know, it's hard for men to cry. I mean, it's not hard for me to cry. You know, I cry all the time. But typically, it's hard for men to cry. And if I were really that upset about my eternal destiny and concerned about my sins and I really wanted to cry, I don't think I'd do it on a national radio program where every listener can hear me crying. But that's what this man did. And it was very moving because he was in despair over his sins. He was a, just a random caller. It wasn't a setup by the radio station. It was a random caller they called in, he'd been listening to the program, and he knew what a mess he'd made of his life. He knew what a sinner he was, and he couldn't do anything but cry convulsively over the phone, which went out over the, the airwaves. And I was so heartened because when the moderator took over the call, a man you know, relinquished it, so to speak, um, he had already said, my battery might be going dead, my cell phone, I don't know how I'm going to keep you. And they no longer had the moderator come back on when they lost him. And the moderator said, I guess his cell phone battery went dead, but I'm sure he's still listening to the radio, so I want to you know, lead him now and how he can be saved. And the first thing the, the radio guy said as he was like leading in prayer was, oh, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And I was so glad to hear that, because sometimes we leave that out. And you can't leave it out. If if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. It's a simple way of, of saying it. And I can stand before you today and tell you that when I was 23 years old, and that's the point where it was a pivotal point in my life when God just changed everything. And I can absolutely stand before you and say what what changed was that's when I heard the message that Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. 
Now, I had heard he wanted to be my savior. I had heard, you know, just, just accept him as your savior, trust him for salvation. When you die, you'll go to heaven. But I don't think anybody had explained to me, at least I hadn't heard it. Maybe they had and I wasn't listening, which happens a lot. I have a lot in our church too. But somebody clearly said, Jesus is not Lord of your life, George, and nothing's going to change until he becomes that. And I look back to that as the turning point. It was a Thursday night. I was on the other side of Baltimore from where I lived, meeting this man for the first time. And he said, the problems in your life is because Jesus is not Lord of your life, and he wants to be Lord. And it was that, that revelation of me realizing he wants to be Lord. He wants to be on the throne of my life. He doesn't want to be a, just a part of my life. He wants to be the top dog. That that's when everything in this young man's life began to change dramatically. Jesus wants to be Lord of our lives. Will you allow him to be king of your life? Not just somebody, you will, yeah, I hope when I die, I sure want, I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven. So sure, I'll pray the sinner's prayer, but it's my life. I'm not letting him love my life. I'm not giving it to him because I have things I want to do. I still have things I want to come. I still have things I want to buy. I still am going places. I still want certain relationships in my life. I want things a certain way. And I will tell you today that if that's your attitude, Jesus will go quietly away. And you can adopt a life that's kind of a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of me, and after a while, stop feeling convicted. You'll feel good. And, and you put together what is known as a syncretistic form of life. A little bit from here, a little bit from there, and it's a comfortable package that you've designed for yourself. But it's not discipleship. It's not what Jesus calls you to. Yes, he wants to be your savior, but he insists on being your Lord and the king of your life as well. Will you march with all the other followers of Christ? with worship on your lips and palm branches in your hands? Will you crown him King of kings and Lord of lords? Will you gladly, and this can be hard to do, will you gladly decrease and watch him increase? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity you've given me to, to present the Word of God and to prevent, pre present challenge to people and to call people to a lifestyle of repentance, a lifestyle of discipleship, a lifestyle of you insisting on being Lord of their lives. Lord, I am so grateful that when I was 23, that man on the west side of Baltimore, having just met him, I am so thankful that he had the courage to look me in the eye and say, Jesus is not Lord of your life. You say he is, but he's not. If he had held back, if he had been wanting me to like him and didn't want to take the risk of me walking out of his office, he would never have said that. But, but you were directing that man you were telling him that he needed to state that to somebody he had never met before until that evening. And I am so grateful. Because I look at that as the time when you stepped into the mess that my life was, the depressing mess that my life was, where I saw no future, no hope, nothing to look forward to, couldn't see it ever getting any better. But you stepped in and began to change everything and transform everything. And Lord, it just makes this guy praise you and worship you all the more Amen. when I see how real you are, how personal, and how much you want to be on the throne of my life and direct me from glory to glory. Teach me line by line, precept by precept, till at last one day I get to see you in glory. 
Lord, would you just challenge anybody here today that's maybe heard my words and knows that Jesus is not their Lord, is not their Savior, would you not let them easily forget what has been said in this place? Would you not let them easily just go back to business as usual, putting gas in the car, making lunch, turning on the TV, turning on YouTube, going out with friends, drinking something else, alcoholic? May you not let them forget what has been said in this place, but may you hound them the way you hounded Balaam, that stubborn old guy in the Old Testament. May you hound them until they finally relinquish and say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I lay my life down before you. Amen. Amen. Amen.